And also that uh, historically they were always rebels against Moses and Moses' law. And we know that by reading the Old Testament, we know that ourselves. So basically just to summarize what his sermon was to them and what his response to them was, he told them that just because they had a temple at Jerusalem and just because they had uh, the law of Moses, it did not make them a more obedient people to God. That's basically the summer, summary of, of, his ser- of his sermon there that he gave uh, to the council and to these men. Of course, verse 51 and 53, chapter number 7, he, he reminds them, he tells them, he says, uh, you are murderers uh, because you kill the Messiah, the Son of God, just like your forefathers. They would kill the prophets that came before, so you're murderers just like your forefathers were. Of course, they didn't like that, so verses 54 through 59, we saw where they actually gnashed on him with, it, with their teeth. And they actually cast him out of the city, and then, of course, they stoned him with stones. And we know, of course, that he died. Verse 60, we saw a a wonderful picture of dying grace here in the life of Stephen, as well as a a picture of forgiveness. Remember, he said, lay not this sin to their charge, just like Jesus. When they were crucifying him, they said, Father, forgive them, because they know not what they do. So he was following Jesus' pattern there in this picture of forgiveness as as he died. So that wrapped up chapter 7, dealing with Stephen's sermon. And we started in chapter number 8. In verse number 1, we we looked a little bit at uh, Saul and who who Saul was. Several things we talked about. We talked about how he was born in Tarsus. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was the son of a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee as well himself. Talked about a little bit how he was a Roman citizen and how he was educated in Jerusalem at the feet of uh, Gamaliel. Uh, he, remember, he was a, a highly respected uh, Jewish teacher then. And as far as the law itself, uh, Paul Saul, he was blameless. And he was on his way to becoming one of the great Jewish leaders in the Jewish faith. Saul was. A few things there we talked about Saul, because it opened up, verse number one, how he was consenting to the death of Stephen. Verse, also in verse number one, talked a little bit about the church members, how they were scattered once again because of fear, except, of course, the 12 apostles. They were the only ones that stayed back there at Jerusalem. They continued to have the boldness as they did back in chapters four. In chapter five, verse number two, devout men, of course, came and took Stephen's body and took him for burial, and they lament, uh, lamented over him. They, they loved him. So they were really grieved that he that he died. We also talked about how the word devote, devout here actually uh, gives the idea of being uh, cautious or anxious because of the persecution that was going on in the church at that time. Now we got the first part of verse number three. Talked a little bit of how where it says Paul made Saul. I'm sorry, made havoc of the church, and that gives the idea of how a a, uh, a wild animal would mangle. His prey, and remember, he had just consented to the awful stoning of Stephen, and we know, you know, what kind of death that is, and and uh, all the bloodshed and things when when somebody gets stoned. So that was the uh, the meaning of that word. So we'll take back up here in chapter uh, eight, verse number three. But let me just back up, and I'll reread verses one through four, and we're going to look a little bit more here of of Saul and some of the things that Saul was doing to the church. Okay, Acts chapter 8, verse number 1, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore they they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, preaching the word. So back to verse 3, we already talked a little bit about the uh, how they made havoc. Saul made havoc of the church, but it says also he entered into every house, hailing men and women, committed them to prison. This word hailing here just means to drag. So he would actually go into their houses, go into the synagogues, and he would actually drag them out because uh, they were worshiping uh, the Lord. And he would actually drag them literally uh, to jail. To the common prison back then. A few more things we find in the book of Acts that, that he did. And Paul himself 
acknowledges that he did these things later on, of course, after his conversion, uh, when he actually became the apostle Paul. Acts chapter 22, uh, verse number 4, uh, he persecuted them, uh, he said, unto death. Acts, 24 verse, Acts 22, verse 4. This is Paul, of course, speaking. He says, I persecuted this way unto death binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. So that goes along with what we talked about, how he, he actually drug these these people to prison. Uh, and it, he not only entered into houses, it said he entered into every house here, but he says in Acts 22 verse 19, he also went into the synagogues to get these people where they were actually worshiping. And he says, I said, Lord, they know that I am prison and beat in every synagogue them that believed on on thee. So he would go to the houses. He would go to the synagogue and he would get these people that were worshiping the Lord. And of course, we also, when we've been talking, he, he had them beating, beaten. He had them put uh, into prison. I'll read you a few more verses. Again, this is Paul acknowledging himself what he did in the past. Acts 26, verse 9 through 11. He says, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them off in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even to strange cities. So Paul, he... We know he cons Saul consented to the death here of Stephen, but he also consented to the death of many, many other uh, church members, early church members that was trying to, to serve the Lord. And if they, if they renounced their faith, uh, then they would be free. But if not, uh, he would have them killed, as I just read there in Acts 26, verse number 11. He was consenting unto their death. And also, I read in, in verse 11 there, that he described himself as being exceedingly mad against them. So, I mean, it just made him furious that they were were not, you know, taking everything 100% in Moses' law, but they were following Jesus now, this Jesus of Nazareth. And it, he was just furious that they were doing this. And one other thing about him, later in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 13, when he was writing to, writing to Timothy, uh, he called himself a blasphemer, a persecutor, an injurious person. And that word just means a violent. And I think that's easy to see. Paul, Saul was a violent man. 1 Timothy 1, 13, he says, who was, a, who, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And, of course, we know that Saul, he did what he did, uh, ignorantly, uh, in unbelief. Because remember, now, his devotion was to uh, Moses' law. And he was well-versed in, in the law of Moses. And he knew uh, what it says. And that's the way he was trained. Remember, his father, he says his father was a Pharisee as well. So that's all he knew. That's how, that's what he, that's, that's what he was trained to do but again talking a little bit about how he said what he he did what he did ignorantly in unbelief i read i read one verse but let me read you a few more verses here in first timothy chapter number one on what he had to say about his past first timothy chapter one beginning verse number 12 paul says i thank christ jesus our lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth an all, an all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So, you know, Paul, he didn't deny anything that he had done in the past, but he said I, he did it ignorantly uh, through unbelief, but it says he obtained mercy through the Lord. And we, we, we've heard this verse. We even quote it sometimes ourselves, right? Paul said uh, that uh, he was the chief of sinners, and based on some of the things that we've saw here about Saul, he was a chief sinner. I mean, he some of the things he did, they were horrible that he did here to this early church. But he obtained mercy. And in verse 16, he talks about how that it should be a pattern to them which come after. 
And I believe what he's saying is, is even though that I did all this evil against the church and I, did, I committed all these horrible sins, he says God's mercy uh, was to me, was abundant to me. And if it was to me, it can be to you as well. I believe that's the pattern here that he's talking about. So I believe if, if God can save Saul, I believe he could save, save anybody. And we know that's true. God's grace is sufficient. And he's, he's, he's great, where sin abounded, what did it say? Grace did much more abound. So he, if he saves Saul, he can save, he can save anybody. So that's just a few more things there about Saul and some of the things he was doing to the church. Back over to our lesson, Acts chapter 8, verse number 4. says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So what was the church doing? Yeah, they may, they may have scattered because of fear, but they were continuing to spread the gospel. They were continuing to do uh, the Great Commission. They went into other cities preaching. You know, they were in Jerusalem there, but now they started going into other cities. Yeah, again, I've already said it, maybe because of persecution, but yet they were still fulfilling the Great Commission and, go, and doing what? And going into all Judea and into Samaria. And that's what we're about to see in our next few verses, the next couple of chapters, that they were actually going into some of these other cities. Now the word scattered here in verse 4 as well as back up in verse number 1, it, it has the idea of, of, a, of scattering seed. You know, like, like if you're sowing grass seed or something like that, you know how you just you scatter it out. <clears throat> well, I read a, qu a quote this past week. It says, persecution does to the church what wind does to the seed. It scatters it and only produces a greater harvest. So, you know, the persecution that was scattering the church, the, the, the members of the church, so they were able to get the, get the gospel out to more people. We know, we know, you know that's the way. If you was trying to plant some seed, if you was trying to sow some grass seed or something, it was real windy, what's it going to do? It's just going to carry it other places. Well, that may not necessarily, necessarily be a bad thing because you're wanting to get a good coverage, right? So that's what the early church was doing. Yes, they were scattered because of fear, but they were also fulfilling the Great Commission and getting the Word, the word of God out. We saw there in verse number four. So, so we saw here, remember last week when we started, we said there's four different Four different men that we're seeing here in this chapter. We saw the Saul, we called him the zealous persecutor. And then we have Philip, the faithful preacher. And then we have Simon, the deceiver. And then we're going to talk about the Ethiopian eunuch. Well, he was actually a seeker, uh, seeking uh, something from the Lord. So that's, the, that's Saul, the zealous, which means loyal. Talked about that. That's what that means, persecutor here of the church. Well, next we see a faithful preacher or an evangelist, and that's in Philip. And, of course, he was one of the seven. So let's read these, these verses here, 5 through 8, and let's see what Philip did. Remember, he was one, he was one of them that was scattered because only the 12 apostles remained in Jerusalem. But ch chapter 8, verse 5 says, Then Philip went down to the city of Maria, Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord <coughs> gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many were taken, that were taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. So we see here the, the faithful uh, preacher here, this faithful evangelist, Philip. Now, for right now, I'm not going to say much about, well, I'm not going to say anything here about these verses. I want to skip down to our next character and see Simon the, De Simon the Deceiver because I want to, I'm going to come back and pick up these verses when we get to the last half of this chapter dealing with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. We'll come back and address these verses 5 through 8. But next, we want to look at Simon the, uh, the he was actually a clever uh, deceiver, Simon the Sorcerer was here beginning in verse 9 here chapter number 8 so let me read verses 9 through 25 and we'll see what Simon here was up to here in uh, Samaria at this time verse number 9 but there there was a certain man called Simon which before time in that city in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria giving out that himself was some great one to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest saying this man is the great power of God and to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, 
and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, and who, who when, they had, when they were come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So here we see these verses are mainly dealing with Simon, the sorcerer here, in the city of Samaria. Now it's not uncommon to have uh, examples like this because it's a basic principle that we have in Scripture that wherever God sows his seed or so has his believers, uh, that Satan... Uh, will eventually have his counterfeits as well. And I believe that's what Simon, the sorcerer here, I believe that's what he was. Uh, let me read you a few verses here and back over in Matthew. You don't have to turn, but Matthew chapter number 13, this parable here that Jesus gave to his disciples. Matthew 13, verse number 24 says, And another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, they uh, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then, wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he answered, but he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together into the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into the barn. Skip down and read verse number 36. Then said, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went to the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares in the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall be at the end of this world. The son of man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom. All things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire and there shall be welling and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who hath ears to hear. Let him hear. So again we're talking about how anywhere where God has faithful and true believers the Satan's going to come in and he's going to he's going to implement his uh, counterfeits and his uh, false believers. That's, and that's what this parable uh, was all about that Jesus was telling him. said you know, the Son of Man, Jesus, he's came sowing the good seed, but then the enemy, the devils, came in and sowed counterfeit seed. So, you know, there for a while, you know, you can't, you can't tell them apart. But eventually, in the end, of course, we see here, according to this parable, you're going to you be able to tell them uh, the good from the bad, the believers from the non-believers. I mean, it was true. It's true here in this story with Simon, because I believe he's a deceiver. But it's also true in John the Baptist's ministry. It's true in Jesus' ministry. And we'll see later, it's, it's true in the Apostles Paul, Apostle Paul's uh, ministry. You know, uh, there's talk, he talks about wolves and sheep's clothing. Because remember, we've talked about this several times. Satan first comes in as a lion. 
you know, to devour, right? He, he walks about as a lion seeking whom he may devour. But if that fails, then he comes in as a serpent, a serpent uh, to try to deceive. And I believe that's what Simon the sorcerer here was doing at this particular time. So let's look, let's go back and look here at what Simon here was doing. Back in verse number nine, it says, there was, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. So this sorcery here, he, used, he was just practicing magic. That's what the word sorcery here is talking about. It said he bewitched the people because of it. So they, they, were, they were astonished or astounded are confounded at what Simon was actually able to do. Verse number 9, okay, verse 10, 11, it says, To whom they gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with these sorceries or this, this magic here that he was practicing. So uh, they were amazed because they were amazed at the things he was able to do, this magic that he was performing. Uh, they believed what he had to say as well. But they believed that his power uh, was of God. We read that here uh, in verse number uh, 10. They said, this man is a great power of God. Uh, but we know that his power was not of God. His power was from Satan. We know Satan. Satan has great power, not the power that God had. But Satan has power, and his power uh, was, was from Satan. Uh, just like the uh, the man of sin's power, or, or the Antichrist, if you want to use that word, just like his power is going to be from Satan. Second Thessalonians two verse number nine says, "Even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, or even any deceivers that's going to come along." From from what we're reading here, till the Antichrist comes, all in between these deceivers, their power is from Satan not of God. So Simon's here power, it wasn't of, of God, but it was of Satan. Okay, verse number 12, it says, but when they believed Peter, Philip, I'm sorry, because preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So a lot of people here, remember back in, in, in Samaria, Philip was one that was scattered and he had came to Samaria and he, he had preached. Remember, we read one verse already where it says they took heed to what he was reading. So they believed here though, they believed and, and they were baptized. Well, that meant that Simon, of course, was starting to lose some of his followers because before they thought he was the great man and great power of God, but now Philip came preaching Jesus Christ. And they believed, so Simon here, he started losing some of his power. Well, verse 13, first part of verse number 13 says, then Simon himself believed also and was baptized. Now, Simon here you know, supposedly believed, and we know he got baptized. The Bible tells us here uh, he got baptized. But based on the conversation uh, that he's about to have with Peter and John that I already read, we'll get into here a little bit, in a little bit, uh, his, his belief or his faith, I don't believe was real. Uh, it wasn't really based on the Word of God. It, it was, you know what it was based on? It was based on the miracles that Philip uh, was uh, performing. That's what his uh, faith was based on. Look at the last part of verse 13. It says, when he was baptized, it says, he continued with Philip and wandered, beholding the miracles and the signs which he did. So Simon was actually following Philip because of the miracles uh, that was being performed. That's the reason I believe that Simon was actually following uh, Philip. Verse 14 and 15, but it says, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John. And when they were come down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. So word got back to Jerusalem of what was going on here at, this, at uh, Samaria, because remember the apostles, verse number one, chapter eight, they were still in Jerusalem. And they heard that the Samaritans, uh, they were believing, they were, they were being baptized, they were, they were being saved. So they sent Peter and John uh, to check check out what was going on, uh, and also to pray for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Verse 16 and 17, For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they that were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So once Peter, John got there, they saw what was going on, they laid hands on these that had been baptized, so they themselves received uh, the Holy Ghost. Now remember the uh, door of faith if you will, if we'll call it that, 
was open to the Jews at Pentecost, right? We understand that. We know that. That's when, when it was open to the Jews. Well, here, uh, the door is now opened to the Samaritans. And remember the, the Samaritans who they were. They were half Jew, half Gentile, the people that lived there in Samaria. So now the door of faith was opened to them. And, of course, later, as we get into our study, we'll see that the door of faith was opened to the Gentiles in Acts chapter number 10 with the story of uh, Peter and Cornelius. We all know that story. Now, back to here about the apostles laying on their hand, laying their hands on them and then receiving the Holy Ghost. Now, I can't stand up here and tell you that I fully understand uh, why it was done that way. So I'm just, I, I was reading my commentary this week and, and he, gives a, he gives a pretty good explanation, I think, about how things are, we're a little bit different in the first few chapters of the book of Acts compared to, to what we do now. So let me just read his explanation for it. I agree with it, and, and if you don't, then, you know, everybody's got their own uh, opinions about it. Let me just read you what he had to say. He says, now, you've got to remember that the first ten chapters of Acts record a period of transition from the Jew to the Samaritan to the Gentile. We've already talked about that. And God's pattern for today is given in Acts chapter number 10 when Peter visits Cornelius. And that pattern is that the sinner hears the gospel, believes the gospel, receives the gift of the Spirit, and then is baptized. And that's, you know, that's, how we, that's what the pattern is today. It says, uh, but it says it's dangerous to base any doctrine or practice only on what is recorded in Acts chapters 1 through 10. For you might be building on that which was temporary or transitional. Those who claim we must be baptized to receive the gift of the Spirit, as in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, they have a hard time explaining what happened to the Samaritans. And those who claim we must have the laying on of hands to receive the Spirit have a difficult time with Acts chapter number 10, because that's not the way it happened in Acts chapter number 10. Peter preached and they received the Holy Spirit just like they did at Pentecost. So he, said, he goes on to say, once you accept that Acts chapters 1 through 10 are a transitional period in God's plan, with Acts chapter number 10 being the climax, he says the problem should be uh, resolved or it should, you know, maybe explain it a little better on why things were different in the first few chapters of, of the book of Acts. Because again, it was a transitional uh, period. And, and I, I, I tend to agree with his explanation of that. So anyway, they, they came, Peter and John, they came, they laid hands on them at this particular time. Remember, it's a little, little in a transition period, so it's a little different pattern than what we know today. We'll see what happens next after they did that. Verse 18 and 19, it says, Then when, and when Simon saw that through the laying on the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay my hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. So Simon thought now, remember, he was just following Peter because of the miracles, but now he saw this. Peter and John came, laid hands on these people, and they received the Holy Ghost. So now he thought, man, I want this kind of power myself. You know, we talked about, uh, again, already, he would have been following Philip because of the miracles and signs, but now he's interested in this power for himself. Uh, and this just shows the wickedness in his heart. Verse 21, we already read that where Peter told him, he says, you know, you, you've, got, you've, got a wicked, you've got a wicked heart. So we'll stop here and we'll take up again here, again in chapter 8, verses 18, 19, and continue to look a little bit more about Simon. Uh, Simon the sorcerer, or actually uh, Simon the deceiver, say a few more things here that he goes on <clears throat> to do here. Acts chapter 8, verse number 18. Lord, we'll start there again next week.